Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you for coming. Um, I admire your persistence in staying here on such a beautiful day. Last time I was here, it was March, and I can understand why uh, summer here is such a prized possession. The first slide is the obligatory um, disclaimer. Uh, I will assume you've already read that and you understand it. I'll move on very quickly to the, um, just a bit of background about the company, its current capital structure, who we are and what we do. Um, so we're a Vancouver-based, uh, listed here on the, the Venture Exchange. We're a gold uh, explorer. Um, I suppose you'd call us a junior gold explorer. We currently have 81, 81 million odd shares um, issued. There's a lot of warrants. There's a lot of historical warrants from uh, when the company was a shell. Uh, you'll see if you can, if you can read the, the, the fine print there on some of the expiration dates and the value of those options. There's a number of them will be coming up um, and will most likely expire over the next uh, six to 12 months. The, the market cap of the, the company really isn't much more than our cash at the moment. So I want to discuss and, and explain to you what our projects are um, and why my view is that uh, we're currently undervalued and why there is a significant option value uh, in NX Gold. So we have two projects. They possibly couldn't be further away from each other if you tried. Our flagship project is the Kulu project in Nunavut in uh, northern Canada. And then we also have a couple of projects in the Pilbara region uh, of Western Australia. So obviously we, uh, our focus is on good jurisdictions, obviously Canada and Australia, um, in areas where there's strong uh, mining activity and an exploration and mining pedigree. First project I want to talk to you about is Kulu. Now, some of you are familiar faces. I'm sure you're well aware of, uh, of this project and the challenges we're facing uh, with this project. We like the project for a number of, of reasons, and the, the first one I'll explain to you is, is probably a bit of neurology, um, but we're in, uh, in Nunavut in the Kivalik region, which is the southern part of, of Nunavut. And those of you that uh, follow Agnico Eagle would be well aware of their Meliodine uh, project, or their now Meliodine mine, which commenced operations a few months ago. So Meliodine, in my view, is a world-class uh, deposit. It's a world-class operation. Uh, Agnico have done a fantastic job in getting that uh, project into production. It's a large-scale production. This year, it'll be producing in the order of 230,000 ounces. Next year, when it hits full production, its production will be close to 400,000 ounces a year. Initially, an underground mine moving to a combination of underground and open pit. It's a large... Um, deposit, uh, 3.7 million ounces at a solid grade of just over 7 grams a tonne. You can see the Meliodine plant from our license area. Uh, we're directly adjacent. We're on the same geological structure. The fault that uh, they're currently uh, mining at is, uh, continues on up into our project area. Um, the other, the, the challenging part of this project, and which I'll I'll explain to you now is our project is, Inuit, is on Inuit-owned land. So the Kivalik Inuit Association has the, the right and has the right and the power to grant surface license uh, use for surface lands in that area. So we have to um, obtain numerous approvals. Uh, we have not yet been able to renew previously issued licenses for this area. Largely, it's a political and social issue in, in, the, in the area. The town um, very close to uh, the project is called Rankin Inlet. It's about 40 kilometres from our project. Uh, Meliodine is halfway between our project and Rankin Inlet. Rankin's a population, got a population of about two and a half or 3,000 people, which uh, is quite a big town for that part of the world. And the, the community there still does a lot of uh, subsistence hunting and harvesting particularly of caribou, and so with the significant disruption they've had in the area from the construction of Meliodine, the, the issue for the community is that they don't want to give up access at this stage to more land because they're worried about access for hunting. Now we've got NERB approval for our project and for our exploration plan 
we have a water licence so we, we can build a camp and we can draw water from the lakes. We also have an agreement from the uh, Provincial Inuit Association which gives us subsurface access. So we've got three of the four key permits and, and uh, approvals that we require and they were basically they were obtained in record time but we have not yet been able to crack that uh, nut of the Kivalik Inuit Association. And part of that, I think, is um, perhaps personalities of the leadership involved. Um, we've had some, some issues and challenges, which I won't go into here, but I'm happy to discuss uh, afterwards, if you like. Um, interestingly, there is an election coming up at the, by the end of the year for the leadership of the Inuit Association there, which may lead to significant changes, which will then give us the opportunity to dis discuss this matter with new leadership and a new board and they hopefully will be more, more open to, um, to our involvement and our activity in the area. And what's frustrating for us is, um, some of you might be aware, I'm, I'm one of the founding uh, uh, members of uh, NextGen, um, which uh, it has been a very successful uranium story here in Canada with uh, the Arrow Project in Saskatchewan. And one thing we did uh, this year, we won, NextGen won the award for, from the PDAC for the best community and environment uh, uh, program for any company in the industry. So we're very proud of that and we've done, the, the team at NextGen has done a fantastic job um, in the Lalosh community and the local, the local community in Saskatchewan there and has gained international recognition for what they've been doing there. We, we are offering to take that same expertise and those same techniques and skills and, and what we're offering, what we have done um, in Saskatchewan to rank and inlet, but that seems to fall on, well that has fallen on deaf ears with the current leadership of the Inuit Association, which is very frustrating. But that's enough of that rant, but that's why we're not working this project. We, we have a farming agreement here to earn up to 70%. It's currently on force majeure, so we're not spending any money here at the moment because we don't have surface access. We've spent about $850,000 here before the licence expired. Um, we have drill targets ready to go. Um, we've, we've completed geophysics. The, the, the party from which we're farming into this project held the project for six years before uh, reaching agreement with us. They did significant till sampling, mapping, etc. So we have very, very strong um, basic exploration results that we can work on. So we've got drill targets. Um, one of the, another reason we really like the project is that there's significant and very strong boulder um, sampling results and till sampling results. The, the glacial till in this area is quite shallow, but what we've got is we've got boulders at surface and they're very rough. Um, they're not like river pebbles, so they haven't been transported by the glaciers. So, uh, you know, if, if, it's, if they've moved far from source, they'd be all smooth and rounded. Ours are rough. We've got some um, that we've sampled 450 grams a tonne in the boulders. And the, the gold in till sampling is very similar in terms of the, the gold grains that we are recovering are very rough. They haven't been transported. So the theory is that they've, the, the boulders have simply come off the bedrock and been pushed up through the glacial till to the surface. And they're very, very close to source. So we're using that, that technique, and it's a technique that's been used very successfully in uranium exploration in Canada. So we've, we've, we think we've worked out the ice flow movement and direction and how far these boulders have, have been transported, if at all. And so hence we have drill targets ready to go. All we have to do is do a little bit of archaeology. There's about two or three days worth of work, and then we can, we can get ready to drill. So it's very frustrating. Um, for us, it's been a couple of years now that we haven't been able to, to gain access to that. But this is my argument is that once we get access to this project, it's a significant project. It has great potential given where it is and what it's next door to. You know, the potential here is significant. Obviously, it hasn't got a drill hole in it yet. But if we can get access to that and if we can drill, then there's a significant value uplift for the company over the horizon. These are the terms of the farming agreement. You'll, you'll see again, if you can read, there's a lot of words and, on that slide. But effectively, the arrangement is that uh, to earn 
a 70% interest, we need to spend about $35 million over five years or so. I believe we, we should probably renegotiate this. The, the company that we've done this transaction with are um, our shareholders in the company. They're the individuals who discovered Meliodine and Meadowbank. Um, their, their view is that this project is of higher potential than Meliodine and Meadowbank um, at the same stage of exploration. So that's why they've, they're still um, actively involved in the project. They've got an interest in our company and they're very keen for us to progress the project given the work we've done through the next gen entity. They are shareholders there as well. They like the way we work. They like how efficient we are with exploration dollars and that we've had success and they expect us to have a similar sort of success here in, uh, in Nunavut. Moving on to a completely different part of the world, um, to Western Australia. Now, again, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Pilbara and uh, particularly the Pilbara gold story, so excuse me if I'm going over um, old ground here for you. Western Australia is um, you know, probably the heart of the Australian mining industry at the moment. It's the, the home of the iron ore um, industry in Australia with Rio Tinto and BHP and Fortescue Metals. Um, there in the Pilbara. Um, it's a easily accessible region. It's well serviced by infrastructure and mining services. It's got a mining heritage. Um, there's not a lot of completing land use in this area. Um, so it's a great place to, to have a mining project, an exploration project. So the Pilbara has become you know, well known and, uh, recently for its gold um, potential. Um, it started off a couple of years ago, you would have come across the conglomerate story, the melon seed nuggets that our peers have um, discovered and located. Our properties um, are very close to a town called Karatha uh, in the northern, uh, very close to the coast. Um, there's full air service to Karatha, so you can fly there from Perth. It's easy to get to. We've got sealed roads down to our two project areas. The first one, the northern one there, is called Princep and the, the southern group we've, we've called Mount Row. It's quite a small project area combined. There, it's just over 1,200 hectares. The licences we have here are called prospecting licences, so they can only be a small area, about 200 hectares each. So we've got uh, seven prospecting licences between the two um, projects. Holding costs very low for prospecting licences. The annual rent is about $500 each, Australian and the work commitments are very low here as well. It's combined, the, the, the work commitment required is about $20,000 Australian. So we can sit here, we can hold these projects if, if, we, if we want, but we have been um, doing a, a reasonable amount of work here over the last 12 months because we've, we've had these, uh, these nuggets. Um, and we've had a variety of, of nuggets that we've um, discovered. The one, the big picture there on the left with all those nuggets, that was a couple of days' work with an excavator um, that was recently completed, and we put an announcement out with some of that work uh, yesterday, I think it was. So they, they were um, recovered with an excavator down to a much deeper depth than we've previously um, announced and worked with. Previously, it's all been metal detector work, which only goes down 30 or 40 centimetres. With excavator, we took it down to about a metre, a metre and a half, um, and put, put the material through a dry blower and so we recovered, there's about seven or eight ounces worth of gold in that area. But we've adopted a more traditional exploration technique because some of the nuggets we were finding were hackly. They weren't the, the conglomerate style melon seed nuggets. So there's other things going on on this property. So we've reverted, gone back to uh, a little bit of soil sampling and rock chip sampling. Very small detail there. I won't go through the colours and everything, but between the two blocks, we've, we've now got three or four pretty strong drill-ready targets ready to go. Um, probably Princep is probably the main, the most interesting target down the southern end of Princep there. We've got a 200 metre by 75 metre target zone at this stage that we've identified through soils, samples and rock chip samples. We've got rock chip samples sort of up to nine um, grams a tonne, uh, which is pretty interesting for that part of the world and, and lots of good results in the soil sampling. So we've got drill-ready targets to go here. We've got a couple of little heritage things to sort out here. Um, at this stage, we don't have um, a, a drill program planned or ready to go, sub subject to, to funding. 
um, and possibly because it's quite risky exploration, we, we'll probably look for a partner to help us out here. But that's, that's where we're at. Um, two projects, quite diverse parts of the world, drill ready targets on both of them, access issues in Nunavut, which give us, could give us a really big pop if there's some changes at the uh, leadership of the, the local Inuit community. So thank you for your time. Um, I'll be around later for questions and uh, thank you.